So I, I was asked uh, by Georgina uh, to talk to this evening, and I'm delighted to do so. It's always a pleasure to talk anything that Benny is involved in. Um, <laughs> because actually, in some, in some way, Benny, you, you the sort of there's a sort of uh, uh, epitome of what I'm going to talk about, which is a concerned member of civil society. Uh, and indeed, your entire career, over a very long period of time, saving and reinforcing key elements in civil society, including things like the weekly mail at the time, did not go unnoticed by some of us. And so, Georgina was, came to see me and explained to me, if I understand, correctly that one of the problems we're having in South Africa is that the civil society organizations, non-governmental organizations, are really having a really hard time of it as a result of uh, uh, certain funding agencies having, having in a sense, pulled out, we wound up, and also because, um, certainly as I recall, when I was the director of the Center for Applied Legal Studies and was desperately dependent on funding, that much of the money went to government. Never quite understood why, but it did. And all of a sudden, uh, we were left high and dry, those of us who were trying to develop democracy in South Africa in a, in a particular way. And I think what that decision by government proved was just what a hopeless, overly optimistic prediction it was, that suddenly, because we had all fought for democracy, utopia had dawned, all would be well, and uh, quite honestly, civil society could put their feet up because the government of the day representing the Volksgeist would, would do what it was supposed to do. But of course, that's completely naive, and it's naive in any country in the world. And I, in order to try to sort of make sense of all of this, I want to refer you to what I think is a really interesting book which I've sort of been teaching at, at NYU, Okamogu and Robinson called Why Nations Fail. And what it says is, is really, I think, one of the key texts now on economic development. And what they really are saying uh, is a simple point. Is they say, they ask the question, why do certain nations succeed and why do certain nations fail? And their argument is it's not economic policy, it's not geography, it's not culture, it's not value systems. One fundamental thing, which we all know, but they put it very nice and elegantly, it's institutions, and more particularly political institutions. And in turn, those determine economic institutions. And they make a division between what they call extractive institutions and inclusive institutions. And extractive in institutions are we have a small group of individuals who do their best to exploit the society for their own benefit. I suppose as a judge one has to be cautious, sitting judge seat, one has to be cautious about how one draws one's implications for one's own country. Uh, as you, many of you will know, uh, criticizing the government of the day, uh, as one particularly learned judge who's now the deputy chief justice South African has actually quite career limited. Um, in my case, since I don't desire to go anywhere else, I don't really mind. Um, but the truth about it is what, what they were saying, what Agamemnon and Robinson were saying is extractive institutions are ones where a small group of people perpetuate the institution, capture the institutions, and in a sense prostitute the institutions, if you like, for their own vested interests. Whereas inclusive institutions are what really matter because that's where the many are included in the process of government. And a significant issue, I'm not going to give a whole long lecture about their book, but basically it's interesting that they would argue that China actually, because it really is represented by exclusive institutions, will ultimately run out of growth speed unless they convert from extractive to inclusive. In other words, it, at the end of the day, their argument is to be sure certain institutions must be sufficiently centralized to provide basic public services, including justice, enforcement of contracts, education. Uh, but what happens with exclusive institutions is they cannot produce growth over the long run because unless institutions are inclusive, you do not get the level of innovation, you do not get the level of growth that's sustainable over the long haul. And when I read this, I thought to myself, that's true 
That's exactly what's happening in my own society. My own society was designed, meaning our society, to have a constitution which was supposed to have inclusive institutions. That's what it was supposed to be. That's what the constitution suggested. The answer is that there aren't. Well, certainly some of them aren't. So if you're not concerned, you should be. Because let's just look at some of the institutions. Anybody around the table want to suggest to me that the police now represent an inclusive institution? You only have to look at the kind of commission of inquiry down the road at Kalitra or what has been going on with the British force over the last number of years to know that it is truly an exclusive institution perpetuating the interests of some at the expense of everybody else. And the same is true about the National Prosecuting Authority. I don't need to tell you that as a novel proposition. You simply have to read the Similani judgment of the Constitutional Court to realize what was going on there. And and I'm afraid to say that, that although I'm not prepared yet to throw in the towel, uh, one has to argue that the judiciary itself is under far more pressure than I had preferred it to be. And so you can, and the press. How long ago was it that we had a case times as an editor who certainly was unfettered in the way she ran her newspaper, and all of a sudden that just ended violently, and I don't know how much longer you know, we're going to have that kind of media. Yes, to be sure, Twitter and uh, social media might help, but for those of us who love arts, that's a real problem. Uh, <laughs> yeah. but, but much more important than that is that there's not an institution in this country of key portion which assists in governance, which is not either under pressure or which could be classified under the Okamogu Robinson argument as extract. So now, what does that mean? That means that somewhere along the line, groups of people have to stand up and seek to close the gap between the formal promise of inclusive institutions and the reality of exclusive institutions. Business communities, as always, is quite hopeless. It's doing exactly what it did under apartheid, which is basically to do nothing. And then all of a sudden, when chaos occurs, suddenly you start jumping up and down and saying we need change. But that was far too late, if you may recall, in the late 1980s. And I'm struck by that in the work I'm now doing as the chairperson of the tax committee. You know, the extent to which when you talk to business, um, really, I mean, you have as much vision from business as David Moy shows in Managing Manchester United. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, what I, it's a very concerning feature. If you look at civil society, it's very much under pressure. I think it's done heroic work in some ways. I can mention a couple of things. If it hadn't been, I think, for the courage of people in the Social Justice Coalition, we wouldn't have had the Commission of Inquiry in Kailitra, and we wouldn't therefore have had an opportunity to know about policing that is going on on our very normal steps. And if I go back further, if it wasn't for the Treatment Action Campaign, how, much, how many more people would have died? Uh, of the HIV AIDS virus at the time. And, and, and to be sure, the court did a wonderful job uh, in, 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 in its judgment in that particular case. But we all know that it has not been for civil society. That litigation would never have taken place. And the conditions which gave rise to, to that judgment in itself would in turn not have taken place. I mean, one is reminded too, in that particular context, the extraordinary scenario which I'm confronted with quite often uh, when talking overseas with regard to the question of intellectual property. Um, that, you know, how does intellectual property uh, pattern out in relation to developing countries and, and, and the problematic of the TRIPS agreement? I'm not going to go to that, but I do want to remind you one thing. You may recall that it was because of civil society that we were able to have generic medicine for antiretroviral drugs in South Africa. The pharmaceutical companies which brought case for the competition the authorities, which eventually was going to come to my court, and which in some rather egocentric way, I thought, I'm going to make my name, it's a great competition, or I'm going to have to deal with this. That all got settled. But why did it get settled? Because civil society was sufficiently persistent to make sure that the pharmaceutical companies threw in the towel, and we got the antiretroviral generic drugs, which we could afford, and which saved the lives of very significant numbers of people. That was the active nature of civil society. And so what worries me 
to a large degree is perhaps the following. On the one hand, we need inclusive institutions. We need institutions which represent the vast majority of the population. Institutions which deliver to the population at large. Institutions that listen to the civil protests that are occurring on a daily basis, exponentially growing in our country, which should disturb all of us. And when we see a substantive turn to exclusive institutions, the business community should be saying, look at Robin Robinson, the correct, that's not going to produce growth over the long term. So yes, we'll make some money in the short term, but in the long term, we'll be back to where we were back in 1989, when you may remember, the delegation went to FW to take the books and said the country is back. And you know, that's what happens in the long run with exclusive institutions. The business community has a vested interest. And those of us who believe in the quality of life and so should be equally be What has happened? But it seems to me, and I was saying this to Gina earlier, in the 1980s, and I mean no disrespect to anybody here, but if you take yourself back to the 80s in South Africa, if we had a dinner like this, I would suspect it that one person in the party would have been a security branch agent who would have reported back entirely <laughs> uh, for the proceedings of what every one of you had to say. Right. They were very good about that, you may remember. We now know that because we've, we've basically seen this process through the Truth and Reconciliation um, Commission. And I was particularly reminded about it myself when years after uh, we got democracy, Two ex students of mine, who I deeply suspected they were always security guard agents, suddenly pitched up at a, at a talk I was giving at the University of Pretoria on human rights, introduced themselves as Major X and Colonel Y. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what happened was in those days, even though we, were, we knew that was the case, everybody spoke up. In other words, there was a, a very vibrant conversation that took place even though you could do so at serious risk to your, to your person. What worries me is that that's no longer the case. That in relation to white South Africans, the feeling is that you won't say anything because if you do, you'll be accused of being a racist. Well, that happened to me, frankly, and uh, I still live to tell the tale. In fact, to the extent that Barney Pigiana and I and I have very civilized conversations. He tells me that I, he was wrong, uh, uh, on the one hand. And if you're black, you basically are regarded as a traitor and Uncle Tom. And it does seem to me that unless people are going to, in a sense, be supported by an active civil society, it's for me not particularly surprising that they have such a poverty of discourse in South Africa, which is particularly worrying. And I know for a fact that when I was directing the Center of Applied Legal Studies in the 1990s, and when we produced more people who were actually negotiating the constitutional text than any other organization, I mean, people who you would know, such as Edwin Cameron and Alton Cheadle and Fink Hansen, and a whole range of others, for uh, uh, a a whole range of people who were there. We were there because we were sponsored by people within, within the various agencies, the foreign aid agencies. If we had not got that money, we got very little from South Africa, we would not have been able to be there. And ironically, we would not have been able to draft the kind of constitution which I think does give us the possibility of an inclusive institution. And so, I was particularly struck recently in this regard, if I may, say, by um, Edwin Cameron, my colleague at the Constitutional Court's recent book, in which he talks about the possibility of optimism, as opposed to my rather gloomy uh, uh, analysis. And he says the following. He says that one of the reasons why one should be somewhat more optimistic is because, quite, people have claimed the Constitution as their own. And he writes, gay and lesbian um, youngsters from the rural areas, service delivery protests, protesters in the towns and the cities, opposition parties and factions in the ANC, uh, all not only accept the legitimacy of the values and rights of the Constitution, but they claim them loudly for themselves. Well, they may do, but I don't share his optimism. I say that they may do, 
But that depends on us like, creating the infrastructure <coughs> which is required for that particular purpose. Cameron then does go on to say, our country is far from here. Dishonest leadership, corruption, the destruction of numerous state institutions could still wreck our ambitious constitutional project. And in that he's absolutely right. The question is, what are we going to do about it? Because you sit by and say, well, it's fine. Now, some people will say, well, we'll wait for the election, and in the election we'll get, you know, the DA and all these other parties will get lots of votes, and as a result of which all will be fine. Well, frankly, well, that's a very naive proposition. Inclusive institutions are not built by political parties. My suspicion is, sorry for the cynicism, that one party comes into power and do exactly what the others are. One of the extraordinary features of South Africa is that in the 1980s, I could have used the Okamogu and Robinson analysis to tell you about extractive um, institutions and inclusive ones, and the simple point was that they were racially exclusive. Now we've got slightly more non-racial exclusive institutions. But they're still exclusive because they exclude the vast majority of people. They're still essentially <coughs> a perpetual invested interest. They're still subverting the promise of our constitution in a fundamental way. And what worries me with that analysis is, why do we have so much apathy? I mean, it seems to me if you take, for example, a simple proposition of the Cape Times, I would have hoped that something rather more substantial would have occurred rather than really loud protests that actually happened when, when a great newspaper was hijacked in the way it was. It seems to me a great sadness to me, certainly, and it's an important institution, whatever one may say. And that's true of others. In certain cases, civil society has done glorious work, uh, in, in, as I've indicated to some extent. But it's increasingly impoverished. It's increasingly not getting support of South Africans is increasingly estranged from the kind of funding that it should get. You know, it sort of reminds me of the um, of the joke, the old joke, pardon me, of the of the naked woman who gets into the New York cab and the cabbie driver is an old Jewish man and he looks at her and she says, sorry, what's wrong? I mean, God, have you ever seen a naked woman before? What's wrong? Why don't you take me where I've got you? No, it's not about the fact that you were uh, naked, that's absolutely fine. I have no objections to that at all. She said, well, what's the problem? She says, I'm trying to wonder where have you put the money for the fair? <laughs> <laughs> and, and the point, the point I'm simply making is that to a large degree, you know, what has happened to us uh, in any and all sorts of ways, why is it that we have acquiesced with such extraordinary ease? I can give you some answers. The desire, business, to simply kind of couple to the extractive institutions and hope that they part. People, my own colleagues, I'm not talking about judicial colleagues, I'm talking about colleagues right across the board, who feel that they don't want to say anything because they may lose out on a government contract or two, or in fact be subjected to some level of abuse. That, yes, Julian, when you said to me, you know, why, why is it Earlier when we were having a drink, do we eschew questions of criticism? Is it because we're scared of the racial epithet? Well, the answer is yes, probably we are. And what the tragedy about that is, is that if we took a principial position, which means that we criticize across the board, and we, we behave as, as uh, active citizens in civil society, then that particular proposition should actually not, not in fact, be one that we should be worried about. Because the job is to create a non-racial institution, not, not to create a racial one. That doesn't mean that one is insensitive to the issue of transformation of our society. No, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Inclusive institutions are about transformation. Exclusive institutions are about staying where we were in one bizarre way or another. And so the question is twofold. How do we develop a framework where we actually, um, in some substantial way, actually can unify behind a broad vision. Perhaps it is the Constitution, overwritten as it is. And on which, by the way, if you think that you're going to get the, the utopia through the judiciary, I'm no. awfully sorry to say you're not, but that's because judges across the world, I don't think that they can bear the weight of social change. I don't think that's the judicial function at large. We can create spaces, but people have to move into those spaces. 
So what I'm really saying is, on the one hand, how do we actually proclaim active citizenship, which, which actually promotes the kind of vision which is in the Constitution? How do we recapture the visions that we might have had in 1994? How do we kind of vindicate a lot of the reflections that took place when Mr. Mandela died and which people actually for the first time in a long while started to think, what is it we've lost from those glorious aspirations of 1994 to where we are in the degrading realities of 2014? And how more than that do we actually reinforce those courageous institutions of civil society which actually are trying to insist that our institutions should be inclusive and that they should vindicate the promises which were made in the Constitution. That's the challenge. And I know I'm talking to the converted, but out of there, as every one of you will know, there are all sorts of people who don't either care less or simply want to make a quick buck on an extractive basis and couldn't care less about the future in the country in the long run. And it's those people we have to persuade in order to help us and help the whole country to move forward. Because if we don't, I'm sorry to tell you that uh, uh, after 2014 and after the election is over, we'll be back to the same reality, scratching our heads and saying, how on earth are we going to get out of this mess? And the only answer to that is, by being active citizens and doing it ourselves. Um, to some extent, that's what we did. We should, between the, in the 70s and the 80s, uh, I think one of our dangers, I can conclude on this, is we should not be prisoners of a history that has now been thrust upon us. The real history is that ordinary people actually stood up and actually did things. I mentioned many. There were lots of bennies. Every single one of you who, who, who I know of, uh, men publishing in, in Rafe Press, those are the contributions of an enormous, enormous kind of, sorry, single other people. I'm just making an illustration. And those kinds of contributions were made by people standing up and saying, enough's enough, we have to change our society. Well, the answer is that unlike the 1980s, we do have a roadmap. It's called the Constitution. We should actually lay claim to it and actually ensure that it works, not through the judiciary, the public but through the kind of active citizenship which, in fact, is so absent and which, in a sense, has to a large and sad extent allowed extractive institutions to grow and the promise of inclusive institutions to be reduced. So when Edmund Cameron does say, our country is far from healed, he is indeed correct. When he says that dishonest leadership, corruption, the structure of the independent state institutions could still wreak havoc on our ambitious constitutional project, he's dead right. And the real question we have to ask ourselves, will we do nothing? To either not support civil society, not do the kinds of work we, we, we should be doing, not that like any contribution in the material, practical, or any other way. And ask, what, are we get, what will history say of us? Well, one thing it will say is that we actually really are responsible for the demise of men. Nobody else is to blame but ourselves. Thank you.